Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This episode was recorded on Friday, November 9th, 2018, starting at 1.33 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the 180th episode of the show. For more information about how to subscribe to the podcast and help support the production of future episodes by becoming a patron, please visit theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with Demetra George about her new book titled Ancient Astrology in Theory and Practice, A Manual of Traditional Techniques. Uh, hi, Demetra. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Chris. Hey. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about this. We are, we're literally on the cusp of the release of your book, finally, which I believe is going to come out sometime in the next 24 hours, right? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. And um, I've already got a proof copy. We've been reading through and like proofing it mm -hmm. over the course of the past month, and it's a really amazing book. So I'm actually really excited, actually really excited to talk to you about yeah. this today. So first, congratulations on the release of the book. I know this is something you've been working on for quite a while, right? Right. It has been a long time. I think really it's been 20 years in the making, and then um, it's probably the actual well i think for each chapter since then there must be 13 or 14 versions of each chapter so it's been a process right and it turned out to be a pretty big book where you guys ended up actually breaking it up into two volumes mm -hmm. so that this is actually it's it's almost 600 pages but this is just part 1 of two volumes right Right, that's correct. And as I was writing it, uh, on one hand, my intention when I started was to have it be short and simple and concise in a workbook that just dealt with the fundamental principles. But as I started writing, more and more details kept coming out. And then I'd go back and try to delete and rewrite passages and pages and sections, only to find out that the material kept showing up as I went on. So at a certain point, I surrendered to the fact that it wasn't going to be a stripped down distillation of the material, but that I was going to include as much of the richness of the tradition as was wanting to come through. And at that point, until um, it began to be typeset, I really didn't know how long it was going to be because a certain part of it is full of workbook exercises. Right. So that's actually really important that that ties back into your earlier career where your second book was actually a workbook. It was a very well regarded and it's still a very popular intro book to modern astrology, mm -hmm. um, which also had that workbook format as well, right? Exactly. And I remember of doing the beginnings of that at the very start of my astrology teaching career and find trying to create uh, structures to train people's thinking about how to um, combine the elements of planet, sign, house, and aspect. And uh, that has proved to be a tremendously popular book that is held through the ages. Teachers have said that they either use it as their text or if they recommend it, then people who are working with it progress much faster because the certain form for how to construct the astrological statements becomes embedded in their thinking. Right. And the, and the title mm -hmm. of that book is Astrology, Astrology for, your... for Yourself, a workbook for personal transformation. It's how to learn astrology by working on your own chart. And to a certain extent, this is a continuation of that process where each one of the 60 chapters ends in a workbook exercise. There are two uh, worked out examples for the reader to follow, and then there are precise instructions given for repeating the process a third time with your own chart. And this is something that I've been developing since... Um, for the Hellenistic astrology since I began teaching at Kepler College in um, 2001. We offered the first course in Hellenistic. But in the years of taking private students since then, I've had them go through these exercises. And I found that 
to the extent that a student does them in order and is conscientious in the process, the concepts that seem initially overwhelming or complex become second nature quite quickly. Right, because you're you're literally one of the first people in modern times to start teaching ancient Greco-Roman astrology mm-hmm. to modern astrologers, and so you actually went through the process of figuring out what what works and what doesn't in order to make this material easier for people to grasp. Exactly, and the process that I'm asking the reader to go through, I've taken several hundred people through that process, so I have confidence mm-hmm. that it works. Based upon my experience, right, and and so I had the uh, pleasure of writing the honor of writing the foreword to the book, and I told uh, a little anecdote about actually taking your course mm-hmm. on Hellenistic astrology at Kepler, and how um, there was actually like a, a miscommunication, and I only got um, the the source book, which was a collection of just translations of excerpts from the Hellenistic astrologers that had been prepared by Robert Schmidt of Project Hindsight. And I didn't initially, for the first few weeks of my study, get there was supposed to be a set of notes, a comprehensive set of notes, mm-hmm. which is actually what this book eventually turned into. Exactly. And, and so I struggled actually for the first few weeks of learning Hellenistic mm-hmm. astrology because I was just reading the texts without context. And it's actually extremely difficult to just pick up a book on ancient astrology and start reading it and understand everything the author is saying because ancient astrology is so different from modern astrology. But then eventually, a few weeks into the course, we realized what had happened, and you sent me your notes, and suddenly everything became much easier and much more understandable mm-hmm. because you're such a good um, person at, at knowing how to break down these complex concepts and make them understandable to modern people. And that's really what this book is about, I think, as well, right? Yes, that's exactly <clears throat> the process. And now, uh, this most recent fall, I've done the third um, five-day Hellenistic astrology retreat. Um, the first one, I took the group through basically the contents of this book in uh, five days. We met eight hours a day. And I remember the first day, people's mouths just sort of dropped open, like, you want us to do what? <laughs> and then I said, stay with it, like, you know, trust me. And by the fifth day, they were all flying through the concepts and the material and just amazed at how much they understood and the nuances of how many different factors are involved in understanding how it is that a planet operates. And that's the essence of volume one. It's called assessing planetary condition. And for each planet, um, we subject it to 30 or 40 different criteria that are based on sect and the sign it's in and the power it has in various signs, its relationship to the sun, to the aspects. And each factor yields more information about how effectively the planet can bring forth the things it represents and it's trying to do in ways that are most beneficial for the individual. So then, In many uh, astrology interpretation books, it's like one sign fits all. Mars in, let's say, Gemini or the third house has one stock interpretation of two paragraphs. And through the richness of the ancient tradition, we find how many more factors were involved in understanding the multivaried ways in which a planet brings about the matters that it's trying to. Right, and and so it's like in a, from a modern perspective, it's it's not usually giving like value judgments or that there can be better or worse placements. It's just giving almost psychological interpretations. But in this approach, you're actually trying to determine the condition of the planet in the chart to see how well it's able to do its job, and then that has both psychological as well as sometimes literal manifestations in the person's life. Exactly. Um, you know, one of the Simple examples I use is that you may have two individuals who both want to, let's say, start their own business. They're both intelligent. They're both um, competent. They're both worthy. um, And one is able to do so easily 
And another one, no matter how hard they try, they struggle with bringing forth less results for greater, from greater effort. And it's in the understanding of planetary condition that it um, illuminates to the reader why things are easier for some people than for others and what are the particular um, strengths and weaknesses an individual needs to factor into their approach to bringing about their objectives. Where are they most vulnerable and how is it that that can be seen in the chart? Right. And instead of somehow that being disempowering, which right. is the fear I think that modern astrologers sometimes mm -hmm. have about that approach, instead sometimes it can be more validating about what a person already does know and understand about their life in some ways. Exactly. It's, you know, I'm not the take home is that it isn't that I'm a bad person or I'm an incompetent person, but this is something I never realized that was a blind spot in how I functioned. And now I have the insight to be able to recognize that. And then within that, being able to do what one can to right. both mitigate it or to be able to accept it and move forward. Sure. So, and you get into a lot of different um, types of conditions in terms of planetary condition. Um, I mean, one of the things I really appreciated in this book where we knew we knew for a long time that you've been working on it and that it would come out and it complements my book very well but one of the things i'm almost jealous about is that you do give a little historical overview in the beginning but it's relatively concise mm -hmm. compared to like the 200 pages right. i spent in the first part of my book <laughs> right. and then you just jump right into the technique so this is very much a technique oriented book yeah. and you're able to go much further into some specific techniques than i did because you don't spend all that time sort of worrying about the history, but you just sort of give this very nice overview of the history of the past mm -hmm. 2,000 years, or actually it's more like 4,000 years of the practice yes. of astrology, and then you get right to how do we use this today? Exactly. And, you know, I had spent many years putting together the history and philosophy of ancient astrology when I taught at Kepler College. And then as we were both um, getting serious about writing our books, um, there was a point in which I was very happy to let you um, do the history, the philosophy, some of the conceptual um, issues, right? Um, because I'd already done that, so I didn't need to do it over again. But I wanted to see all the places that you were going to take this material to, and then that sort of relieved me of the responsibility of um, tending to that part because I knew that it would already be done and it would be done in a wonderful way. So right. that was and because some of the best. Yes, we worked you, together in sort of sorting out how we were going to have our books complement each other. Right. Um, and so one of the nice things about that then is that you're able to go into some techniques that I either only mentioned in passing mm -hmm. or couldn't deal with at all. So one of the things that you're able to address, for example, that I was excited about is uh, spear bearing. You actually address that concept yes. in, in this book. Yes. And, um, you know, many astrologers by now have heard us use the word maltreatment of um, specialized ways in which um, planets or the functions that they represent can be severely impaired or damaged, making it difficult to bring forth the most positive things that those planets represent. But in the um, source text, either right before the treatment of maltreatment or right after, um, both Antiochus and Porphyry talk about spear bearers. And these are actually um, bodyguards. And these are ways in which planetary patterns can offer protection which is the corollary to the patterns that cause danger or damage. And um, the notion of um, spear bearers, especially as we saw in the text, is that it was often used to indicate a person who is very eminent. And if we think of queens and queens or important political figures, they all have entourages of bodyguards that accompany them. 
And this was the notion of spear bearers um, for the in the ancient texts and laying out the ways that you can see uh, the way in which certain parts of the chart um, are not only protected, but they signify a person who is has the eminence that warrants being protected. Right. I love that. So it's like a celebrity that has a bodyguard or even yeah. like the, the president has the secret service that's exactly. like fans out physically in front and behind. Yeah. And then in the actual astrological concept, one of the definitions, one of the versions of spear bearing is having planets either in a conjunction on both sides, either directly in front or directly behind, protecting one mm -hmm. of the luminaries. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, and you spend quite a bit of time going into that because there's three different Ver variants or versions of spear bearing, and then you give worksheets for how to calculate it in a person's chart. Right, and this is one really one of the most complex of the preliminary topics in the ancient material. Um, there is some variation among the authors. There are some texts that are incomplete, and um, <clears throat> what I've done is. Um, worked with each of the authors, taken it as far as I could, given the material that um, is presented, and then create worksheets. Um, and in some cases, it's easy for people to figure out if there are spear bearer bodyguards in their chart or in other people's charts. And in other cases, you get to a certain point and you're not sure how to read it. And if you go back to the text, the texts themselves are inconclusive. So I think this was a concept that a number of ancient astrologers struggled with. And as time went on, each one tried to interpret, the, reinterpret the material according to their own understanding. So I hope that in my chapter on that, I both conveyed the tradition and then laid out a format that people could follow um, with the view that there are certain pieces of this doctrine that are inconclusive. Right. Yeah. Um, and part of the background behind that is back in 2010, you actually set out and you completed translating, or you did translations of all of the relevant texts, of all of the different definitions of spear bearing mm -hmm. and maltreatment, and all of the different definitions of type types of aspect doctrines that the Hellenistic astrologers had. And then you actually asked me and Ben Dykes if we wanted to get get together for a yes. week on the coast of Oregon in order to put all these different definitions together and then reconstruct what we thought the original mm -hmm. definitions of things like spear bearing and maltreatment and other things like right. that were. And over the course of the week, we had this really amazing collaboration. And at the end of it, we did have what we felt like was a pretty solid reconstruction of mm -hmm. most of it. Right. That was a glorious week, like one of the high points as I reflect back upon my life that we were there in an oceanfront condo on the Pacific coast. And we had brought our lexicons and dictionaries and, you know, manuscripts and texts and translations and went through sometimes from, you know, early in the morning until the wee hours of the night, totally immersed in this conversation, <laughs> punctuated by walks on the beach and looking at the waves, the tides coming in and out. And that was like, for the whole concept of the um, scholar in the tower, um, that was really one of the more glorious weeks of my life. Yeah, definitely. I'm really mm -hmm. glad that we did that. Yeah. And then pieces of that reconstruction that we yeah. came up with that week have come out in different places. I know Ben Included a little bit. I think it was in his introductions exactly. to introduction astro to astrology. Yeah, was yeah. that it? Was it? Yeah. I can't remember if it was. It wasn't astro traditional astrology for today, but it was his other one. Um, it was titled. I think it was titled like Introductions exactly. to Astrology, mm -hmm. Abu Mashar and Al Kabisi. Yeah. So he was trying to introduce a lot of the medieval definitions of basic concepts in the aspect doctrine and things like that. But in order to do so, he also introduced and talked about some of the Hellenistic precursors, which are the mm -hmm. ones that we did, had tried to reconstruct. Yes. So that came out, I think, in 2010 or 2011. And then in my book, I introduced large parts of my understanding of mm -hmm. that in a few chapters, especially surrounding the bonification right. and maltreatment techniques. 
And now in this book, you've introduced basically all of the rest of it and, and your understanding of all of that as well. Yeah. So, and what was interesting though, and one of the things will be interesting for students of ancient and traditional astrology to look at is sometimes there were still uh, p- p- points of uncertainty or disagreements about certain aspects of some of the definitions, though, in different ways that you could interpret certain sentences that would have vastly different meanings from a from a practical standpoint, especially with the definition of maltreatment, right? Yes, there was. And so at least in one um, instance, both you and I settled on different interpretations um, based on our reading of the text. And sometimes I say, you know, it all depends on where you think the comma should have been placed. <laughs> right. It's literally something like that, like the grammar of the yeah. sentence completely and how you read it completely changes right. how you would apply it to charts. Do you mind if we read that definition of maltreatment really quickly for C- the sake? Certainly. Okay. So, um, so here's your translation. It says, concerning injury, it's called maltreatment whenever some star is struck with a ray or is struck with a ray by malefics, or it is enclosed, or if it is in a connection, sunafe, with a destructive star or an adherence, in brackets, kalesis, or if it is opposed or overcome or ruled by an evildoer which is badly situated, and when it itself declines in the ineffective places. And that's from Porphyry's introduction from the Third or fourth century. So, um, what are, I mean, maybe we should go through the list in terms of some of those, like really quickly. So, this is a definition of maltreatment. So, this is supposed to be the most extreme versions of what modern astrologers sometimes call affliction, except in modern astrology, that's more of like a generic term that doesn't right, have any. Right. Affliction includes other factors as well. Right. Yeah. Whereas this is more like a specific yeah. set of conditions of extreme, like worst case scenario for a planet, right? And a relatively let let not so frequent. It's um, not uncommon for charts not to have any maltreatment conditions, and so when you see them, it's a sort of red flag to pay attention that there's a problem here. Right. And then you also, in other chapters, talk about yeah. a corresponding set of positive conditions that can indicate very um, good things about a planet's yes. condition. Okay. So, um, some of the different ones here that are relatively straightforward are things like being overcome by a malefic is a condition of maltreatment, according to this text. Well, I think this is the point on which we differ. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Exactly. This is <laughs> the point where. Uh, it's not so straightforward. So the difference of interpretation is that very last sentence where it says, and when it itself declines in the ineffective places, you you've ta- you take that to apply grammatically to the entirety of the rest of the definition? Um, no. Um, or, or no, I'm let's sorry, see. but yeah. the part where it says by an, an evildoer which is badly situated. Yes, that's the piece. So then- there's a series of conditions, and then there's an and, and then they list three that the planet is overcome or opposed or in the domicile of a malefic that's badly situated. And so badly situated um, or in disadvantaged places refers to the house location of the malefic planet. And if that planet is in houses whose topics are problematical topics, such as the sixth house of illness or the eighth house of um, death or the twelfth house of um, suffering and other kinds of um, grave difficulties, because those are the topics that the planet in that house has to use in order to bring forth what it represents when a planet is in one of those difficult houses and overcoming has the superior square to a planet or opposes a planet by whole sign or is the domicile lord, then that's what brings that more um, graver level 
of difficulty to the experiences of the individual. It's not simply being opposed by Mars or Saturn or having the superior square, but that Mars and Saturn is in a house sector of the chart whose topics through which it expresses that they themselves are the most difficult topics of life. So it's a double um, condition almost. So anyway, that's my um, rationale for why I have included that the malefic being a difficult planet as well as making that superior square or opposition. Right. So that's so that's the interpretation that you take in reading the text that it's not just that it is overcome or opposed or ruled by a malefic, but the malefic itself also has to be in one of the difficult houses, exactly. especially the the sixth or the twelfth. Or even the eighth, because I think that the very last piece, then there's a comma, and mm-hmm. then the last piece piece says, or um and and this has been something that, you know, all of us, including Schmidt, has gone back and forth with. It seems almost as if a, if a planet is simply in the sixth or twelfth house, that also is enough to create a situation of distress for the planet. Right, because the final clause is, yeah. and when it itself declines right. in the ineffective places. Yeah. And so I've interpreted that as a whole seventh condition just unto itself that exactly mm-hmm. of a, a malefic planet uh, ruling another planet and then the malefic being badly situated in the sixth mm-hmm. or twelfth house, which is a condition known as counteraction. Yeah. So that's like a second interpretation. And then Schmidt has a whole eighth separate th- interpretation, right. which is that it's just a planet placed in one of the bad houses, especially the sixth or twelfth. So that means between the three of us, we have three um, entirely different interpretations of this one passage, depending on how you read the grammar. Right. And that, to our audience, that may seem very confusing or weird, or how come that's the case. But in terms of reading Greek, it's not unusual. Um, the um, ancients often said that the Greeks were liars. And that was because the syntax of their language could be could be interpreted in so many different ways. So someone could seemingly be giving you a compliment, but really for those who like could read underneath it, you could see it was an insult. And when I was uh, in the years after I um, graduated from the U of O, I participated in a reading group that some um, graduate students and professors were in, and we would read different texts. And they could spend um, an hour discussing one sentence in the text we were reading with each person offering their own interpretation of that sentence. And that often became the substance of our reading group, was seeing the variety of ways that... um, each reader could interpret, as I said, one particular sentence. So the fact that we've all landed in that position over the maltreatment definitions is not unusual in the larger context of people reading and understanding ancient Greek. Right, because it also involved comparing there was three different texts that survive that preserve that definition, and all of them are slightly different. So it's not even just reading one text and coming to different conclusions. Right. It's attempting to reconcile three different versions of the same definition and figure out what the original one was. And that was a project that orig- originally was undertaken by Robert Schmidt in his 2009 book, Definitions and mm-hmm. Foundations, where he tried to reconstruct the original text underlying all these these three different variations. Right. But then we got together in 2010 to see if we could validate that and if we agreed with the reconstruction or if we came to our own and we ended up coming to different conclusions largely for reasons like this. Exactly. So, and this represents basically the publication of yeah. all of your conclusions and all of the work that you did including what I love about this and what's going to be the most valuable is you did your own independent translations from the Greek for every astrological passage that you translated in mm-hmm. this book, right? Yes. Okay. Right. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. That that took you a yeah. lot of time to to do. Right. And that was like uh, 
when we were so confused over the all of the as understanding the aspect doctrine at a certain point i realized that i was never going to really get it unless i sat down and did my own translations and that sort of opened up the areas where i saw how different translators interpreted a single word and that's what really helped me get into deeper layers and understanding the material Right, just because there's so many different ways then that you can practice astrology and establish the doctrines mm-hmm. depending on how you interpret the texts. And you you wouldn't think sometimes that they could be that wildly different, but this is this is a really good example of how that can have like major practical implications. Oh, exactly. And for anyone who's ever um let's say read uh, the Greek tragedy plays, there are many different translations of the same play. And if you pick them up, you can see how much they vary. And if you happen to be looking at the Greek as well, sometimes you look at someone's translation, you go, oh my goodness, like, how could they get these English words out of these Greek words? Like, it makes no sense at all what they've done with it. But someone just picking up any old translation wouldn't realize uh, what a great variation there can be based upon the um, knowledge and the bias of the translator. Sure. So there's a little bit of that in here in terms of presenting the translations and then explaining what they mean, but you're also just focused on trying to show people what they would do with this material, um, You know, taking this interpretation of the different texts, and this is how you apply it. And then throughout the book, you focus on a recurring application of the techniques to two specific example charts. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I've been working with the chart of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis for a number of years. And so I work the, each principle I present, um, I work the interpretation through with her chart. And then, um, I do it with a second chart, which is that of Pablo Picasso. And I was looking for a man that everyone knew that had a night chart instead of a day chart. And at a certain point, that's what I landed upon. So then there's two fully worked out examples that the students can read. And then the instructions start again from the beginning. Now take the process and do it with your own chart. And I remember um, one moment in the uh, retreat that we did, um, the afternoon sessions, people worked together in small groups. And there was one student that went, ah, (laughs) what to do? And then uh, the person in your group said, wait a second, let's just go to instruction number one. Let's just read that, see what it says, put in the box what she tells us to. Now go to instruction number two, follow that. And then by the end of that sequence, the students were able to replicate the process. So I tried like, not to um, make any previous assumptions of what you should know or what you may have forgotten, but there is a tremendous amount of repetition in the book. Um, I think that's probably what takes up some of all of the pages. But in my work of um, being a teacher, I understand that many people need to, if it's a new concept, they need to hear it repeated over a number of different times before it finally sinks in. And with that repetition, comes the mastery of the um, understanding. Right. Yeah. And and that's a lot of what the book focuses on is just Mm -hmm. forcing you at the end of the instructional chapters to then write this out in a chart because sometimes it's only by doing so that you truly start to understand and the knowledge starts to sink in. Exactly. And you also see what you didn't understand, in fact, and then you're forced to go back and re-look at that material until you clarify it. Right. And it's all progressive. Um, it would be quite challenging, not knowing any traditional astrology, to just jump in and start the aspect chapter because each chapter builds upon the previous one. Right. And one of the things that you did that I was surprised at that's really nice is you do in some places like summaries where you do short paragraphs or just sentence to summarize the basic principles, and it almost mm-hmm. takes on the form of like a traditional 
list of aphorisms, basically, of just like the key points yeah. of this section of the book. Yes, and that's also part of it. It's okay, these are the main points that um, you should have gotten. And, you know, in some of those medieval books, all we have is the aphorisms, but we don't have the explanation of how you got to that conclusion. Right. And that's what I tried to do in the main text is this is why we've, you know, come to this final conclusion about this, you know, factor, this doctrine. Right. So um, another major component of the book that you spend a lot of time talking about is the solar phase cycle and the importance of some of these concepts, which has the effect of sort of reconnecting astrologers with the astronomy, at least in part, and realizing mm -hmm. that there's a lot to um, the phase relationship that each of the planets has with the sun that has a lot of really important interpretive mm -hmm. meaning. And sometimes it's really small or seemingly minor things, but those minor things can add up to have a big overall effect in terms of the overall interpretation of a planet's condition in a chart. Right. And so it was, um, you know, part of how I start out is this larger um, cosmology that the ancient um, philosophers had that was incorporated by the astrologers. And it starts from the principle of unity into the divine quality of the stars and then the planets are slightly less divine than the fixed stars, and they have these nested orbits. And their first relationship is to the sun and to the moon as the sort of celestial king and queen of the heavens, and then to one another. But in that is the planet's relationship to the sun in terms of their cycles. And the ancient astrologers saw that a planet's speed its visibility, and that its um, a moments when it appeared and disappeared according to its phases or its station turning retrograde or direct were very key moments. They were visual phenomena, but they had great interpretive meaning. And so it's through a thorough understanding of that cycle that the planet has from one conjunction with the sun to the next time it conjuncts the sun, that all of these factors, whether it's going fast or slow, direct or indirect, it's appearing after having been hidden, it's disappearing for a period of time. Um, there are many subtleties of interpretation that come in with each of those moments. And so I've tried not to only say, oh, if a planet is within... 15 degrees of the sun, it's weakened, but to understand that within the entire cycle of its relationship to the sun. And with that astronomical a model to work off of, then the final interpretive conclusions begin to make sense because you see the rationale that has informed those conclusions. And that was the beauty of the Hellenistic astrology at the beginning was as modern astrologers, we learned many things, but we didn't know why. And the Hellenistic began to reveal the underlying structure that informs the delineation of the chart. Right. It seems like the longer and longer the tradition went on, the more it just became lists of rules and understandings yeah. about when you see a placement in a diagram in a chart, this is what it means, or you know, x equals y. But if you take it Far as far back into the tradition as you can, you start to get back to this layer where they're focused more on looking at actual like observational astronomy mm -hmm. and then interpreting the movements and the positions of the planets symbolically as having symbolic import in the person's life. And when you do that, it gets you get connected to this much deeper sort of level of astrology. It seems mm -hmm. like. Um, so with the solar phase cycle, that includes a lot of things like the speed of the planet. Um, the direction that the planet is moving along the zodiac, either yeah. direct or retrograde. Um, it includes visibility conditions, like being able to see the planet in the sky or whether this, the planet is hidden by being too close to the sun so that the sun's light overwhelms it. Um, and there's like a few other conditions in right, that general right, area. There, there are. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's one piece of things in terms of the the visibility and interpreting astronomical 
movement in a symbolic way. Mm -hmm. And then there's also that separate part of Hellenistic astrology, which seems like it's more um, directly symbolic or more based on sort of abstract um, systems or or things like that. Like I'm trying to find a way to describe something like the planetary joys or the thema mundi and the aspect doctrine and other mm -hmm. things like that, where it's more like a you know, Robert Schmidt would always call it like a theoretical construct of some sort where somebody's put something together that almost has an artificial ring to it, but it's not artificial in a bad sense, but instead it's more artificial in a way that's deliberate and thought out where the concepts are interlocking in some way. Yes, there's a very elegant substructure. <laughs> it's often geometrical substructure Geometric, yeah. that underlies the relationships that we accord planets with certain signs and signs with one another and even the aspects um, conforming to the nature of the planets. And it's a simple model, but it ties together all of these pieces into a, an elegant um, explanation. Right. And that's part of the, the beauty and the excitement of the traditional astrology. Yeah, seeing that there was something there that was deliberate and something that was um because sometimes when modern astrologers says when we learn like different pieces of traditional astrology, it just seems very arbitrary and like there doesn't seem to be any rule or reason underlying it. It's just like here's a set of rules and this is how you interpret them and right. that's it. But then suddenly you go back to the Hellenistic tradition and you see many of these rules are part of an overlocking, overarching structure. That's underlying mm -hmm. the entire system in some way. Exactly. And initially, you know, I thought I wanted to make it simple and simply having here are the rules and here's how you do it. But I, then I quickly realized that I was simply unable to do that, that I had to sort of um, explain as best as I could the underlying structure that informed all of the principles and doctrines. So right. that's why both of our books like got to be so big, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> we're yeah. unable to restrain ourselves from providing those explanations as best we could. We have to apologize <laughs> to like future translators and other people <laughs> yeah. uh, transmitting the the books or just carrying them for that yeah. matter. Um, so was that the thing though that got you interested finally? Because there was a period where one of the things that's interesting that's mentioned in the book, or I try to mention mm -hmm. in my preface, is that you were actually the very first subscriber to the Project Hindsight Translation series through this weird um, set of circumstances, right. and you, you know, got some of the translations, and you also attended some of their seminars or their conclaves in mm -hmm. the mid '90s. But it wasn't until after. That around 2000 and 2001, that you really got deeply interested in Hellenistic astrology and went out there to study it and started studying the the text more closely. Mm -hmm. What was it that changed at that point compared to like the mid 90s that really got you interested in it as a modern astrologer? Well, in the mid 90s, when I got interested in it as a modern astrologer, it was like the new big thing in town, so to speak. Um, that you know, Rob Hand was who's a great spokesperson for whatever he believes in, was um, uh, supporting throughout the community. But as I you know, do a little bio on the book of how I got to Hellenistic astrology, that was also connected with a, a regression that I had that sort of focused my attention. But just as when you first looked at the Hellenistic course and the text, and you couldn't understand what they were saying. That was my reaction in the mid '90s. Like I was getting the translations, but they could have still been in Greek for all we knew what they meant. And I remember going to some initial lectures that um, both uh, uh, Bob Schmidt and Rob Hand were giving, and it's like I didn't understand a word that you've said. I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's where I was, let's say, by 1996, 97, three or so years after the first translations began to emerge. And then that's when I went back to graduate school. And it that decision wasn't 
really about learning the Hellenistic material. It was just about continuing my ongoing love of learning and being able to further my education. And I went into classics because of my mythological interests. And then like once I got into the program, it's like, well, you have to learn Greek and Latin because that's what we do here. And it's right. like, okay, whatever. You know, which, my Gemini which is hilarious. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, my Gemini moon just like loves learning almost anything new just for this adventure and the sake of learning. But that's literally one of the like hardest <laughs> things that you could possibly do in grad school is try to go back and study ancient Greek and Latin, but it was done initially just the motivation of, you know, that your background was in mythology and that right. was a major component in your astrological right. career. And so you thought that would be the back, best access point, you know, in gra in grad school was right. learning ancient Greek and Latin, but that turned out to be both incredibly difficult, but then accidentally very useful later on right. when you did get more interested in ancient astrology. Right. So then during those years, 1997 to 2000, um, I sort of put my life as an astrologer on hold because I couldn't do graduate school and continue to travel to conferences and prepare new lectures and to see clients. And my life existed between my study chair, the bus stop, and campus for three years. Um, then, again, as I was ready to graduate, um, Kepler College received its authorization, and I was asked to teach the first year history program because I would have the right degree at the right time that the state board required for authorizing their um, instructors, their teachers. So then I was totally immersed in putting together the history of ancient astrology. So I was aware that Project Hindsight was still continuing to have events at their home in Maryland. But my life was so overwhelmed with this other thing I was doing that there was no way that I could really follow that or participate in it. Um, and then it was at the end of Kepler's first year where I taught the history of ancient and medieval astrology that our students attended a NORWAC where Project Hindsight had a table and a booth and Alan White was talking about the techniques of interpretation with Hellenistic astrology. And our students said to me, what is this about? Like, what are all these techniques? And I realized, yeah, what are all these techniques? You've been learning the history for a year. There's a whole body of practical information that goes with that, that in terms of keeping with the integrity of that program that you should also be exposed to. And then a month later, um, Bob at hindsight was given, giving an intensive, a week long intensive. And I realized that I had to go there and sort of catch up to speed on what they had done during the past four years where I had been totally immersed in graduate school and Kepler's first year program. And that was the moment when not only did I connect with the potency of the techniques, but because I had had enough of the Greek, I was able to hear those teachings in a way that I couldn't have possibly understood four or five years earlier. So that's what happened at that moment. Um, that makes sense. I saw how important the teachings were. I went back to Kepler. I was able to arrange to have that module included in the Kepler curriculum. And then I returned to um, Maryland and to Virginia for a number of months where I put together that first course under the instruction of Alan White and Robert Schmidt. Right. And you wrote a lot of notes. It was just um, probably, I don't know, 200 pages maybe of like a course manual of commentary and instructional manual that would go with some of the translations. And then mm -hmm. those course notes, you've continued to expand as you teach private students over the course of the past exactly. decade and a half. And now that's what this book that, that's is. That's what this book is. And, and I can actually recognize some of the sections of it where I remember it from you know, all those years ago, from more yeah. than 10 years ago now yeah. reading it in the Kepler course. Right. 
And that's, you know, I first started doing the workbook application there because I was still connected with the astrology for yourself model. Okay. So. Right. And you were probably yeah. doing that for some, some of yourself in learning that material yeah. and trying mm -hmm. to systemize and understand right. each of the concepts. All right. Um, yeah. So that's really important. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, one of the issues that we could go into is one of the things that's interesting about the book, actually, and notable is I thought before I read this that it was just going to be about Hellenistic astrology, which is, you know, basically Greco Roman astrology from the first century BCE roughly to the seventh century. But you actually incorporated some later medieval authors um, into your treatment as well, because you've been studying them over the course of the past decade, mm -hmm. um, in addition to some of the yeah. Greek texts. Right. And in um, I tried as much as possible to um, have footnotes from the ancient texts themselves about where these doctrines came from or who said it or to have it go back to is where we could trace it to. And in that search for primary source documentation, it um, inevitably led me into looking at some of the material of the Arabic and medieval authors. And thanks to all of Ben Dyke's translations, um, I had all that material right at my bookshelf. So it was quite impossible not to see how the tradition continued um, into the medieval and Renaissance period. And in volume two, which will be um, mostly about the houses, although I'm treating some other um, pieces on the rulers of the nativity as well, um, that interest in how the tradition developed over the course of 2000 years is especially evident um, where I look at the significations of the houses and find what eight Hellenistic authors said about each house and then eight um, Arabic medieval authors and then a number of Renaissance authors and then the early modern authors to be able to see what pieces of the doctrine survived and remain constant what elements of the houses were added in at certain times and why, what pieces dropped out and perhaps speculate as to why, and then um, be able to do that analysis of our understanding of the houses from the entirety of the tradition. So something that started off in the beginning, well, you know, did Bonatti have anything to say about sect? Because we heard those words, medieval words, a planet being in haze, let's say, that sec-related conditions, but that was a concept that we didn't see in the Hellenistic. And then as I started, again, the Gemini part of myself that can't contain or re refrain, actually, is the word from gathering more and more information. Like, well, what did so-and-so say? And where did they get it from? And like, um, just kept moving me forward through the tradition. So you see more and more of that as the book goes on. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think other traditional astrologers will appreciate yeah. that because um, it sets it up as more something that's useful for, for everybody and not necessarily just one tradition, even if it's very much rooted in the Hellenistic yeah. tradition primarily. Um, and it kind of raises an interesting thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is because traditional astrology was dug up on the one hand, because it was it's partially because it was dug up in different eras where first there was a revival of like Renaissance astrology in the 1980s because the text of William Lilly was rediscovered mm -hmm. and because it was the earliest text written in English, right. you could still read it without any language skills. So there was like a rebirth or rediscovery of Renaissance astrology first, and there was much excitement surrounding that. And then at some point there was also probably after that, a revival of medieval astrology through the work of people like Robert Zoller. Mm -hmm. And he was working on, right. on Latin texts, right. basically like Guido Bonatti and other authors like that. And then eventually there was a revival, especially more recently, of the Hellenistic texts and excitement surrounding 
the Greek texts that were written around the first century or give or take a few centuries. Um, but there's different people, depending on which tradition, oftentimes they started with, that will tend to prefer that tradition. And there's this different sort of um, almost like fundamentalism that sometimes develops out of each tradition, depending yes. on what the person's preference is, where there can be like versions of like Hellenistic fundamentalism of saying the original system was the best and everything else was a de-evolution. There's a medieval fundamentalism we've we've seen sometimes, which is like the Hellenistic astrology was okay, but it really got at its best during the medieval tradition and then it declined during the Renaissance. And then there's like a Renaissance fundamentalism right. where they say the earlier traditions were okay, but it really reached its peak in the Renaissance and then declined after that. Um, how do you you don't seem to oftentimes um, go down that route. And what do you recommend, or how do you do you recommend avoiding that? Is that okay? That impulse? Have you ever had that impulse yourself, or how do you perceive it when you see it in sometimes other practitioners? Um, from a very cynical point of view, um, I understand that wherever an astrologer has invested their um, ego in being right about the kind of astrology they do, and correspondingly, their income is dependent upon their authority and maintaining that authority, um, I understand why many astrologers are so um, rooted in that their astrology is the best and the most correct. But if we take a larger sweep of understanding, we see that astrology has um, made its way around the world almost since the beginning of its development, and that each culture that has received the teachings has, in order to fully integrate them into being applicable to their own experiences, has made certain insights or adaptations that brought it in alignment with their primary beliefs. However, to the extent that we consider that astrology is I hesitate to word the use uh, use the word a language of truth, but the language that it is can reveal the truth of the situation of the condition and fate or karma um, of a person's life and their purpose. Then um, that truth can be communicated in many different languages, and that we have to be careful not to fall into the trap that. The only true word is something that happens in our own language that only we ourselves can understand. And so that gives us that sort of openness to respecting the variety of different traditions that emerge from this one fundamental understanding. And that what I've tried to do in this book is the notion of planetary condition is something that remains uniform from the earliest of times through the Renaissance. This idea that based on a planet's sign and house and relationship to the sun and aspects, its ability to perform its function was easier or harder for the individual, that that's a constant in all of these different traditions. And by speaking to how a certain doctrine developed and was re-understood, my hope is that the book can cut through those barriers of the differences between one tradition and another. Astrologers have always disagreed. Even in the Hellenistic texts, you see Valens says, 
this person said that and that person said whatever, but this is what I think, that this variant of opinion has been continuous. So there's no use in pretending that it hasn't been. But in being able to present the multiplicity and yet from the multiplicity to be able to isolate the things that are continuous and constant is what I tried to do so that hopefully students of medieval or Renaissance astrology can read this book and benefit from the understanding of the principles without it causing them to totally reject a tradition that they are connected with for whatever other reasons. No, no. Did that make yeah, sense? Definitely. And I think you accomplished that because you traced that thread you know, later in the tradition, yeah. in addition to talking about the foundation, I think that's going to have the effect of showing the overlaps more clearly and showing where some of those later things that just became rules or aphorisms originally came from and what the, the original conceptual and, and philosophical yeah. rationale was originally. Um, yeah, it just it comes up sometimes in funny ways because so yeah. much of the tradition became about the textual tradition and right. what texts were transmitted, what texts weren't, what authority is giving to certain mm -hmm. being given to certain texts in different eras versus in other eras, what texts are being given more authority. Um, we came up at the with this at one point um, when you're writing your book and in the editing phase of the question of was Claudius Ptolemy a practicing astrologer and the, some of the debates surrounding that, right. and then the subsequent questions about how much authority to give his text based on what your answer to that question is. And so there's just some tricky issues that, that come up sometimes in mm -hmm. terms of that. Yeah, I mean, what the things that make us question that is all of the other um, Hellenistic astrologers were continually mentioning and citing one another. But Ptolemy is rarely cited by anyone. Um, until way later on, and that he himself isn't including other astrologers whose texts we have in his book. So that's one reason why his book is like different from many of the others. So that makes us wonder if some, in some ways he was outside of the mainstream of the astrological tradition of his day. Right. And one comparison we might have to that in our time right now is that there are a number of academics, especially in Europe and on the continent, who are working with the history of astrology. But they have no idea who the foremost astrological practitioners of today are. And many practicing astrologers have no idea who these academics who are authorities on the academic world are. So that there's a big gap that exists between those two groups today. And I imagine that that could have also been the case in earlier eras. So, and then we also know that one of Ptolemy's objectives was to reconcile um, this new astrology with the philosophy of his day, because he was you know, did have other academic works on optics and astronomy and geography and different subjects out there. Right. He was like a polymath so, that wrote major right. works in a bunch of different right. fields. Right. So I'm sure that in the course of learning a lot about the important subjects of his day, that he did give due attention to astrology and presented it to the best of his abilities. And if he was a great mind, he you know, did a lot of good work in what he set down. But that he was a practicing astrologer in the same way that the others were, there's some question there because no one seems to know about him and he doesn't seem to know about anyone else. Right, and he doesn't. Unlike his contemporaries, he doesn't use any example charts. Right. Whereas somebody like Valens, you have a bunch of, you know, he uses his own chart. He uses like right. cl client charts. He gets in a shipwreck and he goes around and collects everyone on the boat's right. charts afterwards to see like what happened that mm -hmm. coincided with the shipwreck. We don't see that necessarily in Ptolemy. Right. Right. So, um, 
there's that. But that's not to say that his work isn't representative of the period and that it's not valuable. Right. Yeah. I mean, that right. was the question I had as I've been. Yeah. There was a extreme pushback against Ptolemy in, in the 90s, especially in the work mm-hmm. of people like Jeffrey Cornelius and James Holden for many of the reasons that you said. But then there could be um, and then there's also, of course, people that place his work on a, on a pedestal. And up until yeah. recently, it's always been thought of as like the major work on ancient mm-hmm. astrology that that everybody should em- emulate, and was the best example of that. And sometimes in the Renaissance, for example, that reached an extreme version where they would just adopt a bunch of Ptolemy's techniques. Yeah. That even though in some instances they were radically different with what the tradition had been mm-hmm. for 1,700 years up to that point. But all that being said, and despite those two extremes, there's still probably yeah. reason to say we don't necessarily know. And, and he did write a book on astrology. And while he sometimes would omit or just like not talk about concepts or mm-hmm. techniques that he didn't like, um, there were techniques that he did agree with that he does seem to treat competently and mm-hmm. in a way that's not so dissimilar from other astrologers that it's yeah. just like completely breaking with the tradition. It's just that he's not always. Like for example, with lots or the Arabic parts, he doesn't seem to like those very much. He keeps the lot of fortune because he's able to find a rationale for it that he agrees with, but he kind of dispenses with with yeah. all of the rest of them. Right, and there's virtually very little information on the houses. You know, a few lines here and there, but he doesn't really treat the significations of the houses. Right, it's very sporadic, yeah. and he mainly focuses yeah. on like angularity. But not so much on topics necessarily. Yeah, sure. Um, so this so is- there was a, there was another part of that question of how do I deal with other astrologers who are fundamentalists in their own tradition, and um, my sense is not to really disperse my energy by getting involved in those disputes, but by doing the very best work I can with the material that I'm comfortable with and feel competent in, and to let the material speak for itself and to support that which I want to put my energy into um, making available and not get distracted by trying to dispute what someone else is doing. So I tend to ignore it for the most part. Sure. And and you've that's probably been easier because you've done work like with Dennis Harness, you originally co-taught the Hellenistic yeah. course with him where you compared Hellenistic and Vedic astrology yeah. in order to both emphasize and show just by teaching them side by side how many similarities there were, um, as well as you know, the differences. And so exercises like that have probably yeah. been really fruitful in terms of keeping an open mind and seeing the value of that comparison between the traditions. Exactly. What you know, we discovered in that Kepler course was a Hellenistic and Vedic were much more similar than Hellenistic is to modern. Um, and then the second thing was that we would have give a question and have our students both arrive at a judgment using Hellenistic techniques and then using Vedic techniques. And what was often the case is that they arrived at similar conclusions, but used entirely different systems to be able to get there. And so that also opens up your mind. You can't keep it as fixed to um, the one and only way um, point of view. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. And then more relevant in terms of modern astrologers is that you've also continued some of that work in terms of um, not wanting to just do ancient astrology in and of itself, but sometimes now going back and looking for ways to integrate ancient astrology and modern astrology, mm-hmm. or perhaps synthesize the two. Um, yes, that's also, and I've continued to use the asteroids through this whole time period, mm-hmm. and I definitely use the modern planets, uh, the outer planets. Um, so it isn't as if I'm only doing ancient astrology. But I'm using the insights that the foundation of our tradition has given us um, as the fo- as the foundation of my understanding, and then treating asteroids and 
the outer planets while fully considering them, treating them in different ways. And again, doing that layering process with it. So that there's, my belief is that everything in our solar system and even in our cosmos has meaning. Every celestial body has some sort of interpretive meaning. And that opens us up to the asteroids, the trans-Neptunian planets, the fixed stars, and, you know, given the grace that we should live that long, being able to integrate black holes and other galaxies into our understanding. Not that we ourselves should live that long, but that the tradition of astrologers can continue that far out into the future. So it all has interpretive meaning. There's nothing that should be rejected. But that the Hellenistic, unless you have a strong foundation of your house, like you pile up all this other stuff and it's all going to topple over. And so the foundation is so beautiful and elegant and clear and strong. It's hard not to give it the respect that it should have. And that was my intent in bringing forth this work. Awesome. And you feel like having had a long astrological career prior to getting into ancient astrology mm-hmm. and continuing to have a long career afterwards, that going back and, and doing this work and getting into this material has enriched your work as a modern astrologer and created a, a more solid foundation. Absolutely. And the students that I've had, you know, I've asked them afterwards, well, how are your readings? And they say, oh, the readings are so much better than they were before. I feel so much more confident in what I say and understanding why I'm saying it and having some sort of justification for it. And so both in my own, I'm still a, you know, a working astrologer. I see a number of clients every week, every month for years. And I have totally benefited from the um, clarity and depth that the ancient material has added to my practice as a counseling astrologer. I mean, when I do reading, if someone isn't themselves an advanced astrologer interested in the traditional material, I'm not layering it with all of the terminology of maltreatment, sect, and, you know, all of the other um, jargon that we use, but that that information is for the astrologer, him or herself, to be able to feel confident and then saying what they need to to their client with um, a sense of um, purposeful clarity. Yeah, and and really giving people a, a structure for how to go about delineating, delineating a yeah. chart and what steps you take, because that seems right. like the wall that I see most students of astrology hit at some point, like a year or two or maybe a few years yeah. into their studies, which is they know a bunch of different things, they know what everything should mean, but they don't know how to put it together in order to form a meaningful synthesis. And that seems like the main thing that this book is really about is how you form a meaningful synthesis by going through the necessary steps in the right order and knowing what to prioritize or what to put a little bit further down the chain of of, Mm -hmm. um, interpretive principles. Right. I remember when I was a young astrologer, after we learned planets, signs, houses, aspects, transits, progressions, and okay, now you're ready to read charts. And we would go, but like, where do we begin? Like, what do we say first? And the word was, well, each of you have to find your own voice. And then it became a process of, I remember the panic in those early days that You look at the chart, you don't know where to begin. You just land on some aspect that you remember or something that you know about and start talking about it until you exhaust whatever it is you have to say on that and then desperately search for something else to start addressing. And um, I hope that in the process of um, both volume one and volume two, that there's a clear and definite pattern and structure for how to approach the interpretation of not only each planet and its full range of meaning according to its condition, but the various topics of life designated by the houses. You know, how will marriage turn out? How will health turn out? How will children turn out? And in that part two, again, it's the interpretation, one from the planet's point of view, but then 
we turn around and do it from the house topics point of view. So you're considering the questions that people bring to the counseling room from um, a multifaceted perspective and knowing how to proceed specifically within each approach. Brilliant. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, Great. Well, I'm really excited about this. I think the book comes out probably today or tomorrow. We're we're waiting. I think your so your publisher is Aaron Cheek of Rubedo Press, um, which is just amazing. I'm so glad that you guys got together. Aaron Mm -hmm. actually edited my book, and so the fact that he was able to edit and then become the publisher of your book, I was just ecstatic about because I thought he was a great person for the job, and that's really panned out. Yeah, he's been brilliant. That he totally has the conceptual understanding to um, realize what I was trying to do and then through his superb editing skills be able to bring it into a very um, accessible language and presentation and visual presentation as well. Yeah, I mean the book is just laid out beautifully. Like the cover is beautiful. The layout is amazing. Um, All the diagrams came out very nicely. There's a nice um, image of the Zodiac of Dendra on the cover. And um, yeah, so I'm told that the book is, it will eventually be available on Amazon, but for the first month or so, it's primarily going to be available through the publisher's website, which is rubedo.press. Yeah, that's it, rubedo.press. So I'll put a link to the website where you can find the book or you can order the book on the description page for this episode on the astrologypodcast.com. Okay. Um, I'm sure you'll be you'll be speaking at conferences and doing other promotions for the book over the course of the next year. Yes, I will be. And then people can also go to my own website, um, DemetraGeorge.com. Uh, you can join the mailing list and then you'll be getting um, regular notifications of um, the book and ordering um, how to order it and presentations that I'll be doing over the course of the year in conjunction with it. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. All right. And um, I'm trying to think of anything else, but I think that's it. Part two, I'm told, will probably be released somewhere in the early part of like quarter two of next year. So um, hopefully we can maybe we can come back again to talk about part two okay. in a follow-up uh, discussion where you'll be dealing with, as you said, the houses, the master of the nativity, and other topics like that. Mm-hmm. All right, great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for, oh, for joining me. Oh, it's wonderful, today. Chris. Can... Thank you for having me. And I'm just so grateful for our friendship and our astrological collaboration that has gone on almost for two decades now. So that's just wonderful. Me too. Yeah. Um, well, congr- congratulations. Yeah. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing what everyone okay. thinks of the book. Um, so thanks everyone for listening okay. to this episode of the Astrology Podcast. And we will see you again next time. Okay, bye.